Alongside with it, essentially being displaced from our, our host context <laughs> with the campus, I've got to tell you, this has been a bizarre week, um, and one that uh, I guess in some, in some sense or another, I, I would feel it's incumbent upon me to comment on. I honestly don't know what to say. Um, we are certainly living in historic and unprecedented times. I think they are historic and unprecedented only in so far as we have seen a complete outsider to the political establishment to the establishment of government, <laughs> um, uh, not by a landslide, but certainly with um, with certitude. Um, and uh, uh, what what that has done um, to our collective psyche, I've got to tell you, I've been kind of surprised. Um, it seemed like certainly at Brown anyway, the the response, the reaction actually, <laughs> the reaction. It sort of felt like the day uh, when I was a senior in, in, in September uh, that the planes hit the towers. That was my senior year. And I was like, you know, planes hitting towers and three, three, four, five thousand 5,000 people dying versus Donald Trump becoming president. I, I don't really see the same, you know. <laughs> I don't really see that. Um, and I just, I just wanted to say that we've got people in, 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 in the community of RUF who are on either side of that wide variety. Um, I hope that uh, you can um, you know, exercise restraint as well as encourage one another, especially those who aren't here, to exercise restraint. Um, I think we don't tend to confuse unity with uniformity, right? Those are not the same thing, okay? Um, unity is not uniformity um, of value. It's unity of belief with regard to principles, um, but uniformity with regard to policy and, and politics, of which there are many important questions with the president-elect, um, uh, really deep ones, uh, and some contradictions, if you ask me. But we need to be we need to, we need to be careful that we not misinterpret unity to mean uniformity, as if we all walk rank and file with the hate Trump crowd, for instance. We don't. <laughs> uh, certainly, that's a, a big part of the culture. Um, in, in, in this region, but um, uh, I can only commend those parts of the media and the, and the punditocracy who say, you know, well, he is the president-elect, that's by virtue of the Constitution, <laughs> um, and we need to work now to, to be um, an authentic unity, even if it's not a uniformity. Um, and and so as, as Christians, then, I would commend that to you all. Uh, please be careful. Please be careful. You know, we've certainly had some some knee-jerk reactions on Facebook. Uh, not not any leaders, as far as I can tell, but even you know, Facebook kind of goes a long way, and um, that's not the right. That's not the best place unless you're willing to be political about it. Um, that's not without some personal things. From I am not a political person by any means, right? Big mouth, uh, fast talking, opinionated, no time. That's just kind of my. DNA from New York, like, <laughs> politics is not my cup of tea. <laughs> politics versus preaching. They are actually very different. <laughs> um, but at times like these, it, it unnerves me a little bit because I don't, I don't always know. But one thing I do not assume is that uh, we, are, uh, we have, a, we have a, a uniformity of mind. I certainly hope not. You know, I hope you don't agree with me on everything. <laughs> Except that the Bible is the inspired and errant word of God. <laughs> right? <laughs> But as far as policies, as far as economics, immigration, foreign policy, all these important issues, like that needs to be worked out. And um, in that sense, I am not an authority on that. And neither are you. you know, neither are we. Um, we. We have to work through it. And um, I hope that uh, in the spirit of what Max has been leading us in up till now, um, work with one another rather than automatically draw lines. Um, that's all I got. You know, and I'd be ha family group leaders. We did debrief this Wednesday night because family group leaders. We had a training meeting, it wasn't planned. I had I had nine hours worth of training prepped for a three hour meeting, <laughs> and we scrapped about ninety percent of it and just talked. We talked literally, literally, literally talked uh, for about an hour hour and forty minutes about just the you know how to how to how to respond deliberately uh, rather than. Um, react mindlessly and I, that, I think that's the best mode any Christian who wants to be faithful to Jesus and loving and caring to their friends is respond deliberately try and refrain from that reactive mindlessness because it does no good right um, 
If you have any questions, certainly um, I'm available. If you want, if you want to talk to your family or leader, we we have actually prepped for that, um, and um, I'm certainly available to you all. Um, alongside with um, uh, other dramatic goings on, I, I've had a, an administrative snafu. I completely got the date wrong <laughs> on our handout. It is not November 18th. It is November 11th, and we're actually not doing he ascended and there. We're doing the third day he rose again from the dead. What I was doing was prepping a week ahead. Um, which I do from time to time, believe it or not. Um, <laughs> and I got, I, got my, I got my Word documents crossed. And um, the text is right, though. Um, um, I considered kind of bumping off and trying, uh, bumping off our, our normal routine in light of recent historic unpre unprecedented events. Um, but I refrained from doing that because I think in light of the fatalism on one hand that we see writ large, um, perhaps uh, on the other hand, um, the triumphalism Right? Um, what we have uh, as a precious doctrine to um, torpedo both of those fleshly instincts is the doctrine of the resurrection. Uh, on the third day, he rose again from the dead. Um, and um, it really does temper the thing. I will tell you, come what may, even in November, I mean, every four years, the general election happens in November, but we're just all low on energy. Everybody's got midterms. You got like 10 midterms for four classes, right? I mean, that's just kind of the, the nature of the case, what's going on. <laughs> you feel like that those 10 midterms would probably take you about 100 lifetimes to finish. I get it. Um, um, more general, not specific to this week, but more generally what I commend to you is Christians, um, we, we, are, we, we, we ought to aspire to, sort, uh, um, uh, um, to, to be um, exemplars in a sense um, uh, uh, of calmness. When, when you're tired and exhausted, we always want to kind of um, melt down, implode, or melt, you know, explode. Um, neither of which are really helpful, but to maintain a calmness with regard to things, despite how well or how badly circumstances may seem to you, we, we maintain a calmness. And that's really important with regard to the resurrection. I'll tell you, Christians have misunderstood. I, I, I'll tell you, I mean, televangelists have mistaught this doctrine unto a certain kind of triumphalism. Uh, which the, the dark undercurrent of which is um, a fatalism with regard to the present state. Let's just all look forward to glory because all of this is go is going to burn up uh, with hell anyway, right? <laughs> and there, there you got just a really bad, um, overly abstract and dry and honestly useless, useless um, interpretation of the doctrine of the resurrection. Um, I've heard lots of sermons from lots of parts of scripture um, I've got to say, uh, at, lately, John 20 is, is one of um, um, uh, my favorite parts of Scripture to dwell on, honestly, um, in terms of my, my reflections. And if you were here last year, actually, I, th I think we did do this last year. I won't have exactly the same comments, but they're very relevant, especially in such a volatile time uh, like we've seen in recent days, um, uh, in, the, in the past several days this week. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, <clears throat> the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands, the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark 
of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Let's pray. Uh, Father God in heaven, O God the Son and O God the Holy Spirit, grant us peace. Uh, Grant us a supernatural uh, peace uh, that passes understanding. Let it not be a superficial sort, but would it um, get underneath our skin, burrow itself into our bones, and reanimate us in our souls and in our spirits. Provide us uh, your grace um, as its motivation. Um, Give us that uh, fountain, ever-flowing fountain um, of life where we can uh, plug into your existence and see through your eyes all the things that are going on in this world, normal and otherwise. Uh, We thank you and we praise you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There's a sublime quality to this text. Um, or there's a sublime quality to this absolutely mind-blowing text, uh, which is uh, trying to communicate to us, a, a paint a story for us of uh, an earth-shattering, universe-altering reality of Jesus' resurrection. But I would say, I think the, the tenor, the tone, the cadence of um, what these, what John is trying to communicate to us by delivering, writing these events down. Um, The best word that I can come up um, to describe it is that it's sublime. I've got a lot of thoughts going around here, uh, rolling around in my mind. Um, You think you're tired, so am I. (laughs) I got about 10, but I think think the the way I organize this is um, is, is kind of three three movements, three steps, three points. the, the primary effect, the benefit, the, the change, if you will, how, how it has altered the nature of universe, life, and, and everything um, that we know, um, is uh, communicating God's intention to deliver peace. Okay, to, to, to deliver peace. Um, the follow-up points are just two. Um, that peace is a supernatural, it's a meaningful one. It's not a superficial one shoving all the issues under the rug and just making nice with one another, you know, for the Bible tells me so. It's not a kindergarten piece <laughs> where the teacher just disciplines the two kindergartners and tell them to get along and they say, sorry, <laughs> you know, with a caddy kind of peacefulness. <laughs> it, but it's a meaningful, uh, it's a meaningful unity, not a slapstick cosmetic uniformity, okay? Um, um, Secondly, it's affective. Uh, there, there really is um, sentimentality. There's a relational component to the sort of peace that God is trying to deliver by means, that Father, the, God the Father is trying to deliver by means of sending the Son not only to die on the cross, but to be raised from the grave. Okay? 
And so actually, our typical formulations of the gospel, like we are fed to it on, on tele television, <laughs> have to do with Jesus dying on the cross. That's actually wrong. A more thoroughgoing is to speak of not only the cross, but also the empty tomb. Right? Because if all you have is Jesus, supposed Savior, on a cross, that's a pretty dour spirituality, right? I mean, what good is that to you? <laughs> if all you have is somebody who died for you, that's just an eternal debt you have to repay until you die and can no longer pay him back. But the empty tomb actually is a reversal of the, of the sneaky ways that um, only thinking of the gospel as Jesus dying on the cross um, can insinuate itself in the imagination of the believer unto fault. Um, the empty grave means there's nothing left to pay back. It's the verification. So w w when you're actually talking about the gospel in a more thoroughgoing way, we actually talk about not only the cross of Christ, but the empty tomb also, where, where from he was raised and not found. Thank God. <laughs> um, so uh, p peace is the, the, the point, and there's a sublime nature to it that is supernatural, not superficial. But it is also very sentimental, and it's meant to be affective in a relational way. Meaningful on the one hand, relational on the other. Truthful on the one hand, and firm in terms of that truth. Peace must, uh, uh, peace must, um, must win, it must overcome, it will, that's the guarantee. On the other hand, it's uh, rooted in, 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 in the grace of God and his affections. Um, the one thing Jesus doesn't do here, right, is throw open the doors and the windows and say, hey boys, follow me, pick up your swords, I'm back. Is there any hint of triumphalism is there any hint that Jesus is pulling the pin on the nuclear grenade of God's power? And along with his, his newly formed body that has been erased of all the blemishes that he received on the cross is coming with tens of thousands of angels, each of whom can, can slay tens of thousands of earthly soldiers, of human soldiers, right? Is there any indication here that Jesus is, is interested in being victorious? Absolutely none. When else, though, should Jesus have been? <laughs> when else, after expressing, exercising so much restraint on the cross, finally being raised from the grave and coming back and saying, see, I told you so, <laughs> when else should he have done it? <laughs> but immediately what happens is in the closet. They're not even on the second floor. They're on like the attic. They're in the crawl space above the attic <laughs> of this New England colonial house <laughs> with the doors locked. They are cowering in fear. And rather than pulling them out, you know, yanking them out into the bright light saying, boys, buck up, take heart, I've won. And so can you. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Rather than doing that, <laughs> he goes into the closet. He doesn't even unlock the door. He goes through the door, which is an interesting thing. I commented on this before last time I talked. Theologians are very, are very clear on this. Uh, Jesus went through the door not because he was less real than the door, but because the door, the door was less real than him. <laughs> Jesus was more real. <laughs> than any of the doors or walls uh, that stood to hold him out of that uh, door. He went into the closet. Um, have you ever known a time in your life where you wanted to go into the closet and not come out for 24 days, let alone hours? <laughs> have you ever been so discouraged, so disappointed, so exhausted, uh, so angry? Um, uh, have you been a part of a group that was so disaffected with certain results of a recent race that you just wanted to crawl in <laughs> uh, to a hole and just wait until whenever it was next that you could muster the courage to come out. Um, um, there is no triumphalism. In fact, peace be with you is what Jesus is trying to utter to his closest confidants, to his closest friends those whom he would then turn a corner gently and say, with a sense of mission, uh, I am sending you as the Father has sent me. But that's not a call, that's not a call to arms. First, he's meeting them where they are, not trying to overcome them by divine fiat, um, but speak 
uh, words of reassurance at the fear that they are experiencing. This business of Thomas and doubting Thomas is famous in evangelicalism. I want to tell you, where was Thomas at the first meeting? Everyone else was there cowering. Where, where was Thomas? And this is sheer speculation, right? He was probably out looking for a better offer. Right? The others were back, the, the 10 of them, because Judas had been lopped up, right? But the 10 of them were just like, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? They're freaking out. They're just trying to like huddle up and figure out what's the game plan? What's plan B? Well, plan B was, didn't work either. What's plan C? <laughs> we can't even find his body now. What's plan B? <laughs> what are we going to do? And Thomas is like, I heard stuff about Hinduism. That was really interesting. Karma. Yeah. <laughs> you know, maybe I'll go across the street. You know, Jerusalem wasn't this parochial. It was an international city in its own right. Don't read into it like kind of ancient, like stone grinding, reinventing the wheel. Uh, Jerusalem was the hub of trade. It was the eastern shore of the Mediterranean Sea, which was the gateway to the Far East that, we, that they are already discovered for millennia, uh, at, least, at least centuries since the day of Alexander the Great. Okay, so they're not parochial, uh, narrow-minded um, Palestinians, uh, Jewish or otherwise. Um, they'd heard, they've heard of Buddhism <laughs> in some way, shape, or form. I can't substantiate this. If I'm wrong, I could be wrong. Okay, but, but it, was, it was definitely an internationalist kind of place. Um, it was the Roman Empire, right? So Thomas is like, yeah, uh, Dionysus. I've heard good things about him. <laughs> Where was Thomas, right? And, and somehow he's brought back into this conversation later in the passage, right? And we know exactly what his motives were. It was, it was doubt. It was frustration. It was anger. Um, and in the midst of all of that, what Jesus has to say is not get over it. Am I not good enough for you? <laughs> Look at me, folks. Woo! <laughs> not in a callous way. He says, peace be with you. Relax. Not to be too, not to be too casual about it, but he, he's trying to help them ratchet down their fears their disappointments, um, their anger. Whereupon then he turns a corner, breathes into them. And this is a, a breathing is a pretty, I mean, anytime Jesus breathes, right? And the scriptures say, so that's a pretty important activity. It goes back to Genesis 1. Oh, I don't know when God breathed life into Adam and Eve. <laughs> Ezekiel 37, when, the, when God breathed life into the valley, into the dry bones in the valley. Um, Jesus is not just breathing on them uh, with halitosis and bad breath, having eaten the fish that he did according to Luke 24. He's not doing that. <laughs> it is a spiritual action whereby he says, look, I understand you are not only in fear and anger and resentment. I know you're not only disillusioned and jaded. You are dead right now. Your bones are dry, Ezekiel 37. I should have footnoted that. I, I did it afterwards, and after I, I printed it, and I was like, I don't want to reprint these things just for the sake of a footnote. But Ezekiel 37, you are dead right now. You are right now like Adam and Eve before I had formed them out of the mud of the earth. <laughs> That's what he's saying. Because I've just died. You haven't seen me for three whole days. I get it. You are just, You are just kind of barely conscious shells of your living living selves right now. And maybe some of you had actually committed, you know, thought about hurting yourselves. <laughs> right? He goes into the closet. He's not trying to pull them out. There's, there's great, eventually sort of a sending of a push, ascending, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. But it's first, peace. Be with you, and it's a life-giving peace. Uh, I want to go to the third, third person. It's a relational kind of thing. The third point before I get to the second point about the meaningful nature of it. Um, we did talk a little bit about this at family groups, and it was just really eye-opening uh, for me, even as I was working through it with the leaders. And I gave them a copy of this paper by a guy named David English. <laughs> This is dated 1976. I got some of these notes uh, from my mentor, my area coordinator, who preached last week. But um, uh, the first bit is very, um, how do people learn? Okay. And the first line is absolutely, people learn most by being with you. Okay. People learn most by being with you. When I first read it, I just kind of chuckled. I lost it with the family group leaders. I was laughing so hard. But I think that's all. People learn most by being 
with you. If you want to teach somebody something, anything, anything, okay, the number one thing you can do is spend as much time with them as possible. Case in point, parenting, right? And that's what David English says. They learn most by seeing what it means to follow Christ through you and then doing it. I have a two-year-old. I don't. David does. David English does. I have a two-year-old daughter, and it is remarkable to me how much she simply imitates me. If I'm writing with a pen, she wants to write. A pencil won't do. <laughs> uh, she has to have a pen. That's not my two-year-old. That's my six-year-old, actually. He loves drawing in pen. He refuses to do pencil. It drives him and his, his, it drives his parents and his teachers crazy. Um, yet it is amazing, David English continues, and at times frightening how much she has learned this way. Uh, people learn most by being with you. Um, I hope that illustrates the point that, you know, university context learning is not the sort of learning that David English and, and I'm trying to uh, talk with you about. It, it's, it's, not, it's not even an earthly learning. It's not, a, it's not this kind of intellectual process. It's not a process of gaining skills um, for ID majors, right? <laughs> Shaping metal and wood. That's not learning. We call it learning. There's a study of learning. There's education. There's education policy. There are educational dynamics. That there's education degrees you can get, and all education professionals. And I, I commend all those things. But that is not what we are talking about in our UF when we're talking about teaching. That is not what we're talking about in our UF when we talk about <coughs> studying the Bible. That's not what we're talking about when we're talking about Bible study. Uh, that is not what we're talking about when we're talking about learning. Uh, we're talking about a divine process, divinely ordained. People learn whereby uh, people learn most by being with you. And this is hands down what I say. It's like, I may be the pastor. In some sense, I'm a figurehead. I don't live with you. Thank God. <laughs> how, how strange would it be if I lived with you, right? <laughs> Jonathan Coates is like, no. <laughs> what if you woke up one morning and saw me crashing on your couch <laughs> in, your, in your tringle or whatever you all call it now? <laughs> you know, three people in one room. <laughs> what if you found me you know, crashed on the couch in your common area in New Dorm? <laughs> Justin's like, ah, <laughs> what are you doing here? I don't know. What am I doing here? What if God certainly like, divinely teleported me from my bed at home at like 4 a.m. around the, around the strike of midnight on daylight savings or something, and then I just magically appeared in the middle of 257 Thayer or wherever it is, Kenneth lives, what, 315, right? <laughs> and I was like in a sleeping bag on his floor, and he woke up and he was like, <laughs> that would be weird. What it is not weird, though, is you see each other all the time on campus after midnight. <laughs> and that is absolutely not at all weird. And that's where I say what we cherish is that RUF is actually a ministry led by students for students. I certainly help Max help. We, we are outsiders. We, we advise. We, we teach. We model. We demonstrate. Uh, we do leadership kinds of things. Um, uh, but we're very careful. Our influence is not a 2 a.m. You know, crashing on your couch. It kind of, it's very carefully crafted. And we're very intentional. In that. it's just our, that's just our business um, as religious people like we are. But the, the precious treasure um, of this campus ministry is that you have friends, you have leaders. In a, in a, in a, in a biblical way, you have followers. Ooh. <laughs> Who would follow Arthur? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh no. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Every one of you, though, has influence. Every one of you has influence because people learn most by being with you and those with whom you spend the most time, you are bearing an influence on them. And by divine grace and grace alone, that influence is for good, as spontaneous, unplanned, and you know, ill-formed as maybe you think you are with a little bit of guilt and shame. I get it. That's okay. You know, everybody, everybody has their tendencies. Okay, But by grace, your influence upon the people around you with whom you spend the most time at the latest of hours Facebooking, <laughs> um, G-chatting, does anybody do G-chatting, or is it just all Facebook Messenger now? I don't know, you guys have Snapchat, Instagram, that was sort of like five years ago. Um, <coughs> memes are a thing, I don't know, group me, whatever, whatever you all do, I need like 13 different channels of communication and a YouTube channel to figure out what you all do and where you're doing it. <laughs> But people learn most by being with you, and the precious treasure of this ministry is not its staff. It's its leaders. 
family group leaders and LTS. That really is true because they live with you. They know, you know, when you get ambulance to the hospital because you're that sick. And then Eddie gets the call next morning, 6 a.m., 7 a.m., or I get the email. I'm like, okay, let's follow up with that person, <laughs> right? Because I'm usually not up at 3 a.m. unless my baby's crying. Um, uh, it is really important. Um, that's the horizontal. That's just the superficial level. Do you realize, by faith in God, Jesus is with you? Right? All the time. <laughs> all the time. The interesting thing about Thomas is the first episode, the first paragraph where Thomas wasn't there. The second paragraph, Thomas shows up, but Jesus isn't there, right? The third paragraph, Jesus and Thomas both show up, and Jesus basically reiterates to Thomas what Thomas said when Jesus wasn't there. You see that? That's absolutely lovely, don't you see? Jesus isn't being conniving. He's not being, he's not prying into their lives. He's not saying with a an overdone triumphalism on the one hand, uh, here you go, boys, pick up the swords and follow me on the other hand. Thomas, what's wrong with you? You lost the faith. Get in the back of the line. I'll show you, just like I'll show all the world. He's not doing that. He's not doing that. Peace be with you. Thomas, touch. <laughs> touch me. Lifts up his shirt. Feel me. Literally, feel me. And it's absolutely, and Thomas is like, oh, am I allowed to do this? <laughs> is there a secret handshake? Is there some Harry Potter incantation I need to reiterate before I even, even approach? Do I have to like spin three times? <laughs> do some jumping? I mean, what's the protocol here? And Jesus says, there is no protocol. Peace be with you. Feel me. And it's absolute relation. Jesus is completely in touch with this reality. That people learn most, his people learn most by being with him. I know you all want to pray more. I know when you think about Jesus being with you, you want to be with him more. You want to read the Bible more. You want to speak about him more to your non-Christian friends. You want to speak about Christian things with your Christian friends. Like you want to do more of these things. That is not the point. Whether you do them or not, and however, uh, however much time you spend each day, he does it with you all the time. That's his promise. That's his peace that he renders to you. Even in your sin. Even in your sin. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Forsake you. Even in those moments when you really kind of know you're willfully rejecting and running from the glory of God. He says, my people are mine, and they belong to no other. As much as in those moments, negatively so, as when they are praying and fasting and evangelizing and reading and sitting very patiently listening to the preacher in RUF gathering. <laughs> <clears throat> he is always with his people so that they might learn. And by the power of his presence in his word, in, 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 in um, spiritual conversation with one another, trying to kind of articulate the clumsy parts of Christianity to non-Christians. Um, we learn by being with him. That's his promise. That's the surety. And then recognizing that we, sure, we, we, we repent of our sin. We go and sin no more. We, we, be, we you know, be prayerful and, and faithful readers of scripture more and more by the enabling power of his spirit in us. Um, it, but the, this peace is a relational peace. And he says, I will always be with my people. Okay, I just kind of got off track there. Um, the central point of the resurrection is, is not triumphalism on the one hand or Fatalism on the other uh, for having fallen short of what you think are the standards of his resurrection victory. Um, they are the, 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 the propounding, the promoting, the multiplying to his people in, in his living flesh um, the, the, the sure promises that he promises, that, that he gives to be with them um, always. Um, this relational component then, it's sentimental, comes with the fact that you know, this piece is not superficial. It is supernatural. 
Um, the other mind-blowing, uh, universe-altering reality um, is do you realize Jesus is there in the flesh? He's not there as a ghost. He's not there like Casper, right? <laughs> Casper, the friendly ghost. <laughs> He's not. <laughs> I'm like, Abby's laughing. All the rest of you are like, who's Casper? <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, um, or one of, the, you know, one of those characters in Harry Potter that can go through solid objects. Okay, that's not Jesus. Luke 24 is another parallel text to this. Luke 24, Jesus eats fish. He literally eats fish. He says, peace be upon you. Who's hungry, right? <laughs> Who's hungry? Where's the nearest McDonald's? I need a filet of fish sandwich. He really says, I'm hungry. <laughs> is it a filet of fish? No, not a filet of fish. Whatever the equivalent is. <laughs> that was for Eugene. <laughs> Lover of God and McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> and I do too. I love McDonald's. It's great for kids. McDonald's play place. Oh, best thing. <laughs> when you get there, <laughs> you will. You too will see. <laughs> um, um, Jesus come, showing up, uh, empty, empty tomb, uh, showing up after death uh, in the flesh is absolutely remarkable. He doesn't show up in perfect flesh. He shows up with the blemishes. The, the scars, even, the holes in his skin, okay, um, s materially, substantially, cosmetically, uh, in his hands and side, uh, in his feet. Uh, the marks of the most humiliating, decrepit failure of any person uh, in, during the reign of the Roman Empire, Jesus heralds as the authentic mark to his disciples of who he is, what he has done what he has promised to do and always will to be with them. Um, these marks are forever. Does that give you some kind of indication of what then for Christians suffering in this life means? There's an irony to it. Uh, Jesus is suffering, and this is, sort of, this is sort of a parenthetical thing, like we cannot let it get lost. Jesus is suffering after the grave it was, you know, not like snapped his fingers and those marks. You know, theologians say these marks in his hands and side and feet, he has now forever. Jesus sits at the right hand of, the God, of God the Father. We'll talk about this next Friday. But he is seated at the right, at the right hand of God the Father, um, ruling and reigning in the flesh now, like never before prior to the cross, never before prior to being born, uh, conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. And now he is forever in human flesh, in human form, fully God, and fully man. How does that work? I don't know. But in that flesh then, too, are the marks that he does not bear for shame, but for glory. Why? Because he loves his people. And by those marks, he won them back. <laughs> that, that's going to help us think about what suffering in this look. It's got to help us apply it to our lives, what suffering must look like for believers. Not with an over, over, overdone, overwrought confidence and triumphalism, but with some resilience, come what may. With a little bit of irony, oh, that I would suffer more for the sake of my friends and have the memory of those things, if not the marks of them in my flesh, in heaven, knowing that by them many were one. Were one. Only, in a, only, only subservient to Jesus, of course, because Jesus is the exemplar, right? But that's got to tell us something a little bit about what suffering might look like, what, what the nature of evil is in terms of God's plan. Um, this business of the flesh, though, is, is really interesting. Um, um, heaven has been transformed, right? Heaven has been transformed. That which is of this created order has just been kind of teleported up into the heavenly of heavenlies. Um, the, the intensity of the relational interactions here between heaven and earth are off, off the charts and absolutely mysterious. Um, the questions coming out of this, was Jesus with you and me, for instance, in the moments after he died on the cross? <laughs> the moments after he breathed his last, and, you know, Father, to your, uh, to your spirit, I commend my spirit. Did Jesus cease to be with his church? 
The, inter the intersection here of heaven and earth, of eternal and what is temporal, of the timeline of eternity and the timeline of, of, of civilization, of earth and, this un and the created universe, is, is a massively complex one. And if, you do, if we just kind of thought about it for a second, it just kind of blow your mind away. You, you, you can't engineer that. Now, you can't even really figure it out. But it's, it's the nature in which this text is, is mind-blowing. But, it, but it is an intersection uh, in terms of the flesh entering the heavenly of heavenlies, okay? Um, as well as uh, heaven coming down in, in, in Jesus' body, in heavenly body, with utter materiality. And that's the sense of, this piece is not a superficial piece. This piece is a fleshly one. Peace be to you in your skin. Um, peace be to you even though you feel ugly, literally. Peace be to you, even though you feel like you're out of shape and haven't exercised in like eight years since before your children were born. <laughs> and things are all just going downhill, 36 going on 70. <laughs> right, because it all just goes downhill. After college, your just metabolism slows down, your jump shot, you can't jump as high, you're not as fast. Call of Duty, you slow down, the fast twitch in your thumbs, you'll start losing to 20 year olds when I was 30. That's why I stopped playing my Xbox out of shame. <laughs> What's wrong with me, Jesus? <laughs> I need McDonald's. <laughs> Jesus shows up with literal scars in his hands and feet. And he says, you think you're ugly? Brother or sister, you have no idea. You are lovely. You are lovely. And your body will be remade, but it won't be erased. It'll be restored. It won't be, it won't be, it won't be kind of overcome by divine fiat. It'll be the same DNA. You'll eat the same food. It'll just taste a lot better and won't kill us. <laughs> it won't poison us with GMO kinds of things or free range that and non-free range, caged, right? Caged on the one hand and pesticides on, yeah, pesticides, caged and hormones and antibiotics, like none of that, right? We will eat food in heaven. Um, materiality will be restored. That's the hope. Peace be to you in your skin, not just in your soul, not just in your spiritual thing, not just in a dry, a dry and abstract or even in, in an emotional, immaterial way. Peace be to you so you have lower blood pressure. <laughs> That's not a guarantee. That's the promise, though, one way or another, in this life or the next. And it's as the Lord's Prayer says, thy will be done on earth. As it is in heaven, don't relegate God's peace just to heaven. That for once in, in, your, in a lifetime, once every year or whatever, you can have your heads just stick above the clouds, above the fray, and get a sense of heaven. Don't long for that. That's not what Jesus promises you. He says, peace be to you here and now, even though you just failed. Which means you got a B <laughs> on that midterm last week. <laughs> Most of us, a B is a failure. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> that bee is beautiful. <laughs> no if, ands, or buts about it. <laughs> B stands for beauty. <laughs> no matter what, though, no matter what, whether you're eating McDonald's at midnight and you know you shouldn't because you had it the other last three midnights ago. <laughs> Eat all you want. Peace be to you. You are free. That doesn't mean you're without sin, but you are free from the power of sin. You are free from the guilt of sin. You are free from the shame of sin. Jesus is with you always. You are free from loneliness that sin inspires within your mind. Peace be to you in your body, mind, soul, and spirit. Don't, don't abstract out that it's sort of just the inner, you know, the inner person within you. And then all the rest is just kind of ugly, decrepit, going to burn up. <laughs> don't, don't give in to that kind of fleshly fatalism. That is not what this resurrection, this doctrine of the resurrection teaches us. He is with us and it is meaningful and it must, it must get under your skin as well as into your so-called soul. Uh, it must impact every part of you, including your decisions, including your behavior, including your motivations and your worship. Um, all, all, all those things. Um, this is a peace that is relational. It is um, affective. Jesus is affectionate for his people. Absolutely. It is meaningful in the sense that he, he promises to you 
uh, to restore to you the condition of your very body. If you have had a brush with death, I have not. I, this part for me is, is pretty abstract. I've, I've not like, rolled over in a car. I have not um, had a bout with cancer early in my life. I haven't any. If you or someone you know has had a, a brush with death, you would not be the first, not by any stretch of the imagination, and you won't be the last in RUF to have had that kind of experience. Jesus promises death will be no more. Hmm? If you experience chronic pain, Physically, in your person, one way or another, Jesus promises. If you have allergies, if you have dietary restrictions, some of, some of which can be so extreme that they will kill you. Anaphylactic shock, right? Jesus promises that will go. If you have family members <clears throat> who suffer, Jesus says that will be no more. Because he is with us, he died on the cross, he was raised from the grave, and he bears the proof of those things, the proof of his love in his flesh forever. Okay? And we will be with him. We will be with him to behold the marks of his love as well as to hear it, <laughs> to see it in his eyes and all that, all this, just to sing it with him and hear it from his lips. But we will also see it with him. That's what he promises to us in a sentimental, affective, relational way, as well as in a meaningful, <clears throat> material, and effective way. Father in heaven, <clears throat> God the Father, and God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, thank you for the, the, the sublime nature of your scriptures that does not withhold even a single word that we need to hear for our salvation, for our rest and repose for our relief and for the sake of, of peace in your church. We pray um, that in the midst of <clears throat> the wild oscillations of campus life, the high highs and the low lows, that in the midst, in the midst of the volatility of national dialogue and happenings, um, markets rising and falling, the stock market rising and falling, the politics of things um, churning and uh, roaring and raging like the oceans. Uh, still, uh, King Jesus, you were the one who stood up on that boat um, and, and spoke, the, the, the wind and the waves be still. Um, would you um, inspire within us a fear of the Lord and of the Lord only, whereby we may be wise? Uh, Jesus, come, come into our closets, into the, the private spaces where we want to just huddle up and lock ourselves in a room for 24 days <laughs> um, and speak peace by the, your word of power. Uh, breathe life into that which is dead within us, our souls and spirits for sure. And would you renew us? Speak to us that are However, we see ourselves ugly, guilty, shameful, and in sin. You do not see us that way, for you have died on the cross for our sake. And we are children of the Father. It's such a, such a light thing, really, to thank you, but um, thank you we do nonetheless for being with us always especially for those who are exhausted, especially for those who are disappointed, especially for those who are lonely tonight, especially for those who are suffering. Would you speak to them? Touch them. Invite them to feel you. For now, not literally. <laughs> but, uh, but almost as if, almost as if we were in heaven and we could see you face to face. Meet with them, Lord Jesus, and strengthen the weak. Build up the brokenhearted. We thank you, and we praise you. We pray in your mighty and matchless name. Amen.